Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome to Heretics of Dune Club, session five. We have made it to our penultimate session. It's very exciting. For this session, you should have read pages 455 through 561 of the mass market paperback. And if you are not reading from this particular novelization of Heretics of Dune, then the last sentence of the last chapter is the field marshal would not be able to tell this dangerous fe this dangerous female anything really important. There we go. And uh, before we dive in, I just want to uh, see here. Um, you know, remind all of you wonderful people out there that you can still get a final Dune pack that includes all of the merch for this book club. You can get a sticker sheet, a bookmark, a refrigerator magnet, and some very handsome pins, enamel pins, all designed by me. I'm the graphic designer here, so there you go. There it is. Check it out. It's on bigcartel. Or danicaxix.bigcartel.com if you want to support this scene. All right. Well, enough of that. <laughs> Let's get back to our session. Oh no. Okay, there we go. Never mind. Oh, oh. All right. Here we go. Chapter. Or let's start with our recap, actually. Well, let me go back. Let's start with our quick recap. In session five, we come face to face with forces from the scattering. On Gamu, Lucilla and Duncan are spirited away by Brismali with the help of his allies from the scattering. The two are split up. Lucilla and Brismali, disguised as an honored Montre play femme and her customer for the evening. Meanwhile, Duncan is disguised as a Lilaxu master named Woes, who is guided by a man posing as his face dancer's servant, headed to the capital of the capital city of Yesai. Back on Rakus, the Reverend Mother Superior Teraza has a surprise visit and shows up to give Odrade mad shit for her proposed alliance with the Leilaxu and finds that this woman has leveled up and is totally unrepentant. Taraza interviews Shiana, who also now levels up after passing examination for official entrance into the sisterhood. Speaking of leveling up, Miles Tegg discovers wild new Atreides talents after he experiences the agony of a device from the scattering called a tea probe. Using his new whirlwind ability, he defeats the lost ones who have captured him and makes his own way to Yasai, only to be caught again and now prepares himself to go face to face with an honored Matre in session six. <sighs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> so, chapter 33, Decoys Upon Decoys. Uh, session 5 begins with a hilarious fuck you to Star Wars. I don't know if any of you caught this. I'm sure many of you did catch this. But Frank Herbert starts writing about this expensive really fine wood that used to be grown on Gamu called Pilling, Pilling a Tam. And this very fine, workable, wonderful, nearly indestructible, fire-resistant, fungal-resistant, bug-resistant wood was used by the very rich in the building of their homes and furniture. And they would much prefer to show, you know, like, oh, we're we're rich. We can afford to make everything out of this really fucking awesome wood rather than using declassé mass produced artificial plastic substances like polystene, polaz and pormabat. <sighs> Herbert then goes on to describe 
these three uh, plastic substances as being known as one of the three POs. So <laughs> he's essentially saying that Star Wars is a cheap, artificial, plastic, mass-produced piece of shit. And Dune is the pilling, pilling a tam, real, real, real expensive fine wood. So don't use those three POs. Only the OP. You know what I'm saying? We're only doing the OP in this house. <laughs> but I was cracking up using one of the three POs. Hilarious. Good one. Good one. But I mean, it is funny because it's like, you know, everything's based off of like everybody gets inspired by other things you know other stories other whatever you know and i after reading the foundation trilogy i was like well frank herbert is very inspired by the foundation trilogy but he takes this like some of his ideas and inspiration that he got from that and then he obviously turns it into something that's totally his own and just like really elevated and honestly i i like dune better than i like the foundation series personally speaking um so it's like well i mean i guess you know asimov could maybe get you know like maybe get all bummed on you you know like maybe he thinks you're a 3po but whatever that's that's neither here nor here the neither here nor there let's get back to our book Burz Molly is ready to receive Duncan, Teg, and Lucilla. Uh, we're back on Gamu. And their attackers, uh, when their attackers spring into action, he sees events following his predicted pattern. Uh, the attackers are overconfident in their great numbers, doing the same thing they did at the keep. He sees Duncan and Lucilla coming uphill, and he's watching Teg roast motherfuckers with his laser gun down in the valley below. The Gola and the Reverend Mother take cover in a trench and are dragged down by Bursmali's people and diverted into a tunnel, while two decoys that look like them continue on their original path in their place. They follow their rescuers and are hustled into a ground car with Bursmali. And once inside, 28 diversionary decoy cars and 11 decoy thopters scramble from their positions. I, I love this strategy that Bursmali has. He's like, we're just going to like have so many fucking options of things that they can chase that it's like they're going to have to divert their great numbers and uh, and that's how we're going to deal with how many people we're up against it's like so smart they race through the firefight uh, that's going on all around them and then they ditch the car with Burzmali but the car continues without them inside of it and it takes flight but then it falters and then it crashes and it's like this fake crash is like luring attackers away from them and in the car's direction before it like explodes and it's just like oh my goodness this is yeah it's the unexpected for sure Al Rock. we're doing the unexpected here he learned it at uh <laughs> he learned it from tag a new person um finds them and they follow him and are surrounded by soldiers who protect them in their middle as they flee across a field uh, into the forest and inside a secret passage concealed within the narrow cleft and some rocks. Here they will wait as Bros Molly's decoys upon decoys are launched to, and then later they are going to proceed in an unexpected manner on foot. <laughs> And the chamber that they are inside is not a no chamber, but it is lined with the special type of algae that shields their life forms from any scanners above um, or any prescience, apparently. Like you can only, they'll only just detect that there's vegetable life here. Um, and Lucilla looks around and realizes that they are among a lot of people from the scattering and she's wondering if Bursmali has betrayed them when an old woman enters wearing a black robe similar to that of the Bene Gesserit but worked with golden dragons. The crone observes Lucilla until she is content that Lucilla can pass and she commands the Reverend Mother to trade clothes with her. And it's like, oh, wear it with pride because we killed someone to get this for you. 
Lucilla must disguise herself as an honored Montre and accompany Bersmali, who will be acting as her field worker companion for the night, and travel to Ysai together. Meanwhile, Duncan will be disguised as a Leilaxu master and transported separately to throw off searchers until they get to their no ship, because everyone's looking for Lucilla and Duncan, so we gotta split them up so it'll be easier to travel and not get caught. Lucilla reluctantly agrees to this plan, and as the two trade clothes, the old woman, Sarafa, reveals she's not an old woman, but a bass dancer from the Scattering, which they call, the people of the Scattering call it the Seeking. I like that they have different branding. The Seeking, and her only function and purpose is to kill honored matres. So, I mean, there's people out there in the scattering who hate them, hate these fucking whores so much. <laughs> they have been creating other people whose only number one purpose is to kill these motherfuckers. And uh, Duncan is taken away and Lucilla is instructed by Serafa on how to act the part of a play femme. And uh, she's going to be a fifth stage adept in the Order of Hormu. They warn her of Tantris priests. I love there's a, another religious priesthood around Tantris, but they are like a sexual priesthood and think that sex is the exclusive worship of their god. Uh, and so, let's see here. If one of these priests try to interfere with her, like if someone identifying themselves as a divine tries to interrupt, she is to give Bersmali, who's going to be called Scar, his 50 Solari back, and then she's going to fuck that guy. And then afterwards, Scar will be nearby and he will find her and then they can continue on their way. And I love that Lucilla's like, you know what? After he has sex with me, he's going to know that 50 Solari was not enough because this pussy is popping and we need to make it at least 100 Solari. And <laughs> Seraph was like, what? Okay, uh, I guess, sure. But um, let's see here. And, and also, though, but before you leave, before you guys get out of here, it will be expected that you have already entertained some customers for the evening. So before you guys leave, you need to have sex with Bursmali so people can sense that you've, you know, been fucking this evening. <laughs> I was like, oh, they're just, they are so thorough here. <laughs> so Rafa then quizzes Lucilla on her sexual knowledge. Can she administer the vaginal pulsing? Lucilla's like, I can administer vaginal pulsing from any position. And not only that, I can control the temperature of my pussy. I can arouse the 51 excitation points in 2008 sequences. I know 205, the 205 sexual positions. And I've mastered the 300 steps to orgasmic amplification. Thank you very much. <laughs> Seraph is like, yo, you've got to turn it down a notch. You, you're, you're, the night is late, you know. Uh, you, we, we gotta. You just gotta hide that shit, okay? You can't, you can't be that good in bed. But if anyone, que if you do have to fuck somebody and anyone questions you about it, just say that you're about to undergo a test for advancement. All right. Lucilla has no chill. Uh, yeah, basically, Lucilla fucks exactly Jodo Finn. That's a hundred percent what she's gotta let him. She's gotta let him know. Uh, so the face dancer finishes her advice and Bersmali, uh, she's like, all right, well, I'll leave you guys to it. And they turn and look over and Bersmali's just sitting there naked with a boner, like so excited. He's like, this is the best part of this mission. I'm really excited about my part in this mission. And, um, Lucilla is like, oh, fuck, this should have been Duncan. Why am I fucking Burst Molly right now? This should have been Duncan. And she's so bummed. So bummed. Burst Molly, though, you know, he's pretty excited about it. <sighs> All right, next up, chapter 34. Damn Odrade. <laughs> Damn her. 
I, I enjoyed the header for this chapter. It is your fate, forgetfulness, all of the old lessons of life. You lose and gain and lose and gain again. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> so back on Chapter House, it's morning in Terraza's quarters. Usually we're with her during the late night, but this time we're with her during the morning. And she is plagued with indecision yet again. To go or not to go, that is the question. Her and her counselors have been arguing over Odraid's proposed alliance to make them into, to make themselves into Lilaxu missionaries. Taking a break, she opens a window and lets some fresh air in, meditating on the Bene Gesserit's time on this chapter house planet, cultivating the finest orchards. You, ye shall know them by their fruits. They got the best fruit on this in the galaxy. <laughs> Also, I love the security cattle that they have. They have these ranches with these specially bred cattle who are very, very sensitive to the smell of off-worlders. And so if they smell any off-worlder, they'll just go nuts and start stampeding around and cause like a really big ruckus, which will alert anyone if there's spies on the planet or somebody's landed and they're trying to sneak around and they're not supposed to be there. The cattle will alert them, which I think is hilarious it's amazing and she also wonders at their subtle urban planning it looks very subtle very haphazard but really like everything on this planet is built for security and it's built in a very specific way a member of her council remains in her doorway waiting for a decision hoping that Teraza will have odraid killed out of hand this woman is Belanda. she's old she's fat and she's vicious as fuck. <laughs> and she's been vehemently arguing against the Alliance, accusing Odraid's, uh, accusing Odraid of uh, being just hungry for power and this just being a natural consequence of her Atreides and Carino heritage. It's like this woman in her past lives has so many power hungry motherfuckers who are at the top of all sorts of situations governments and everything else so this is obviously a power move we got to get rid of her fun fact uh we also learn about odraid is she was sent to al Danab at one point in her training a planet similar to seleucia secundus which was the carino planet where they it was similar to Rackus, and it it's wasn't like a desert, but it was like had a really, really bad fucking weather, and that's where they trained um, their soldiers. But, uh, but yeah, she was trained there in condition to a harsh climate, knowing that she may be taken to Rackus someday. Teresa looks up at Belanda and thinks, she is too fat. She flaunts that before us. <laughs> I love that that's Belanda's form of rebellion towards the sisterhood you know because like all the sisters like they're sisters they're sisters for life they're sisters to the grave but that doesn't mean they're not bitter about anything you know it's like they're still they still have their shit that they're bitter about and they have their own little private ways of rebellion and this is her private way of rebellion is to just be fatter than she should be there was like no like what are you doing girl the reverend mother tells her that she will not eliminate odraid or the gola uh, and Belanda continues to quarrel with her, going round and round in these circular arguments. Teraza understands her fears of the Bene Gesserit losing their independence as they had lost it under the tyrant for 3,500 years. But this project is too important to abort. We are so close. We cannot just pull the plug on this, okay? And Belanda isn't sure if this is their project really or if it's something set in motion by the tyrant centuries ago. How do we even know this is our project? This could be some manipulation of the old worm. <laughs> we could be doing exactly what he wants, and we think that we're doing what we want to do. We never completely escape the teachers of our childhood, nor any of the patterns that formed us, do we? That's a great, that's a great sentence. I meditated upon that sentence. I was like, yes. That is very true. We do never completely escape the teachers of our childhood, nor any of the patterns that form us. It's very, it's very wise, Belanda. Teraza argues that she sees no escape in what Odraid has done. And if they go with it, 
you know what? It's fine. We'll just go back to the way it was before the pre-tyrant times, okay? We're going to feign subservience to a ruler. I mean, were we ever truly subservient to the emperor when we were aligned with him? No. You know, we still did what we wanted to do. You know, like, it'll be fine. And, um... That's not good enough for Belanda. You know, she believes that we are still in Tyrant's trap. And I wish we could just at least kill the Gola. <laughs> Can we at least kill the Gola? Terraza explains that all of Belanda's propositions lead to their alienation from Rakis and the Leilaxu, both of which are the only sources of Melange. Uh, and guess what? The Sisterhood cannot survive without Melange. Bell thinks that they could weather 50 generations or maybe more with their current stockpiles of the spice and Terraza is like this is this type of short-sighted bullshit thinking that is precisely why you're not sitting in my chair like this is why you can't be the leader because that is such a dumb idea like you think 50 generations is a long time like get out of here the reverend mother superior thinks to herself that she may actually have to kill Belanda if she keeps going but where's the noble purpose in that she tells Belle to get the fuck out and continues to ponder their situation. The secret of the axolotl tank is so close. And with that, we don't need Rackus or the Leiloxu and we can make our own spice. You know, if we can just ally with these motherfuckers and learn their secrets, then we can just make it and not have to deal with anything. You know, like that alone could be worth this entire venture. Terraza finds herself worried by the words of the tyrant on Rackus and is frustrated by that the old worm can still touch them even after all these centuries. Uh, would he have seen this situation? Would he have seen this bump on the road in his golden path when the lost ones returned to take their elders' secrets? She wonders about the new face dancers and how perfect mimics could offer a form of immortality. And would the Leilaxu masters be able to maintain control? over such a mimic? These are the questions. She thinks of Odraid having all of the pieces in her hands. She's got Shiana, the Lelaxu master of masters, maybe soon the Gola, if he finally gets to Rackus. And this Atreides could take Rackus if she really wanted to. Is she using her wild talents? Hmm, <laughs> she, is she using that? Crucial decisions are being made on Rackus by a person with typical Atreides weaknesses. Although, to be fair, Odraid's flaw of being benevolent with her erring uh, previous acolytes did help expo expose the flaw in those acolytes because they would develop affection for their teacher in return for her benevolence. And then when the sisterhood saw this, they would have other sisters take these acolytes in hand and then correct them and get rid of this affection. And so uh, they were corrected, as it were. So, I mean, you know, it's like, well, without her being benevolent and having her flaw of her mild warmth, they would never have figured that out, possibly. While thinking about the mind clouding by, while thinking about how mind-clouding affection can be, she realizes that her own current form of melancholy can be just as bad. She's a little, she's a little down about this whole situation. Odraid's actions have stirred up melancholy in the Reverend Mother Superior, but Odraid knows that after these bouts of melancholy, Taraza always regains a firmer grip on her life and its purposes. Uh, and that her authority over her sisters becomes stronger. Plus, she knows about the hidden rage within Taraza, the rage that lurks in her core. Odraid is the only one who sees her rage, the rage against the uses others have made of her life. But, uh, and it's something that she forever suppresses. It's never something that she plans to heal. It is a painful thing that fuels her and keeps her going, a thing that she touches now to restore the strength in herself. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's really interesting. I feel like, I feel like after my bouts of melancholy, I always, I always also regain a firmer grip on my life, 
you know, and then there, you know, and there is something to be said about the rage. It is, it does provide a fantastic fuel to keep going when things get tough. Ah, Taraza runs a simulation in her mind. We play the necessary role that saves us. The Bene Gesserit will persist. How long would they be subservient this time? Another 3,500 years? Well, fuck it. Even if it is, it's still only going to be a temporary thing. We're going to do it. And Taraza decides, I will go to Rackus. And I might have to kill Odrain. I don't know yet. We'll see. Ah! <clears throat> Chapter 35. I am moving with dangerous speed. What a fun chapter. <sighs> On Gamma, Miles Tag awakens. He is gagged and his hands are tied, but he's not blindfolded. And that is an ominous detail, letting the Bashar know that his captors are most likely planning to kill him so they don't give a fuck who he sees, what he sees. They don't plan for him to live long. He's being carried on a suspenser litter down a trail towards a dilapidated shack. And inside, though, the shack is very well maintained and contains what looks like an Ixian probe. And Miles is a little confused. He's like, can't they smell the shear on me? Like, what are, what are they going to do here? There are three interrogators inside. There is a man named Yar who is to be at the controls of this torture device. You have an androgynous female who is uh, called Materly, who is to be uh, the role, who is to play the role of the good cop during this interrogation. And, there, and then, and then there is a man who is an official observer to whomever is in charge of this operation. So this guy is uh in contact with the people at the top they position this t probe in place placing the hood over his head and fixing its electrodes to his scalp tag identifies materly as his good cop when she takes his gag off the interrogation begins the t the t probe sends agonizing pain throughout tag's body and it's so painful that he thinks to himself that this must be similar to the spice agony that the Reverend Mother's experience. And every bit of his training comes into play from stop him to stop him from spilling any secrets. When they find nothing on their monitor, Maiderly calls their first round to an end with Yar offering to attach the special contact to his penis, <laughs> which does not happen, thankfully. Playing her role admirably, she dismisses this suggestion and pleads with Miles to tell them what they need to know so they can end his suffering. I don't want to see you like this. Just tell us what we need to know. This is terrible. I don't want to watch this. Tag, based Tag strikes again, and he says, tell your masters for me that she is really good at this. He's like, I don't tell you guys shit. I tell you nothing. And round two begins. They give him the maximum pain level this time, and Tag is once again plunged into an agony. An agony so great that he finds himself disassociating, like he mentally removes himself from it, and he finds this place of utter stillness within himself, a place that's so profoundly quiet that he wonders if he's dead. But no. He listens, he finds his heartbeat, and now the words of his captors are spelling themselves in white across the black void of his visual center. He reads them, and they're talking about how, how he can't consciously hear them anymore, and that they need to take him deeper in order to get their information from him. They quickly realize that yes, he can still hear them and they are aghast at this Mintat's prowess. He should be totally cut off from his senses. Teg follows his awareness and observes how the machine is working on him. This hellish device is now in command of his body and can make him blink, fart, gasp, shit, piss, anything. It could, it could tell him to do anything. Um, and it is telling him to do things that he, it's like these terrible odors are coming out of him. And he's like, oh, God, like, oh, what is that? What this is oh, <laughs> the worst. 
The three interrogators are at a loss when the Bashar is still able to make words come out of his mouth. Uh, They keep going with their machine, however, uh, which is trying to make a duplicate copy of Tag, a simulation Tag. It's replaying smells and recording the memories that the smells induce in him. He smells the hot wax he spilled on his hand when he was at school. He smells the wet wool of his clothing at the Battle of Ponciard and thinks about his preference for natural fabrics over synthetics because he feels synthetics smell of oppression. And this is an Atreides prejudice that he has inherited. And he's like, you know, wool. And and I love that he says to himself, he's like, you know, wool. I mean, that's still also made in captive factories, you know, but he's just like, it doesn't matter. Like, I just feel like this is oppressive. And if it smells like oppression, I don't like it. I'm an Atreides and I don't like it. The three interrogators are, um, oh, wait, hold on. During the process, he finds that he has gained access to a new muscle and is able to rise above the probe and anticipate its moves all the while examining the memories being induced by the machine he is back on Laernus. he's 11 he's sitting outside his mother's door with a young Bene Gesserit acolyte who's trying out her new skills on him she's trying to pump him from information without his awareness but Teg is aware Thanks to his mother, who has taught him uh, that, you know, people are going to try to get information out of you. You live in a Reverend Mother's household. People always want information. So you got to be wary of these motherfuckers. And when somebody does come to question you, you have to judge the questioner and fit your responses according to the susceptibilities. He judges this girl to have an inflated view of herself and plays coy with the acolyte letting her overcome his reluctance with her great powers and gives her a handful of lies that will only get the girl reprimanded should she ever share them with the Reverend Mother that she came to Teg's house with. In the room, the interrogators think they have him now. So it's like he has this memory of like somebody trying to get information out of him, you know, so that's like this memory is like giving him strength now. In the room, the interrogators think they have him and attempts to ask the simulation Tag where they have taken the Gola, but they aren't getting anything. And Tag opens his eyes. Ah! And he sees all of them moving in slow motion. He easily unties his restraints and releases himself from the probe's electrodes and realizes that he is moving with dangerous speed. Tag moves and crushes the functionary's throat, breaks Yara's neck, and chops majorly in the throat, too. He's just crushing throats, you know? And this probe's agony has somehow lifted him to a new level of ability. A new wild Atreides talent has been unlocked. And you remember, too, when he was in school, I mean, they were like, trying to like see if he had weird powers but like he failed all these tests but they also didn't just like put him through an insane amount of like painful agony that like unlocks new things and that's and that's another thing that i i really enjoy about frank herbert's work is that frank herbert is a no pain no gain believer he believes in no pain no gain in order to become a reverend mother you have to go through an incredible the spice agony the spice i mean it's like it's like you know how women are like oh you'll never know pain because you'll never have a baby you know it's this is like a whole other level it's like well you'll never know pain because you'll never go through the spice agony you'll never know what i had to go through and so that's how you are you know acquire your other memories that's how you like do these things and so yet again we have him showing us that like if you want (laughs) if you want some like special new abilities you're going to have to go through hell to get them. You're going to have to go through some shit and it's going to be painful. But after that, like, you know, you're going to find wonderful gifts from going after going through this pain. Um, so now Ted goes back into normal speed and then he feels a great hunger. He just burned a lot of calories, okay? He just burned, like, mad calories. And uh, Miles erases the data storage system before he leaves the shack, so there's no information left behind. And he, uh, bursting into whirlwind speed, he pops out the door and he kills the guards. And then he finds himself looking down into a valley at the city of Yasai. He is free! 
and it's gonna be traveling into town. <laughs> Dookie Shoe says, Opio opioid withdrawals agony. Too bad you don't get cool powers from it. Uh, I mean, you don't get maybe cool powers from it, but maybe maybe you do gain something if you are able to summit that mountain. You know, maybe you can find something, a new strength in yourself that you didn't know you had. Uh, yes, Teg is a gangster, Davey. Teg is, I, Miles Teg is like the coolest motherfucker in like the entire series. Like he's so cool. Like he's so cool. Miles Teg is the coolest. Like he is extremely based. We love him. Chapter 36, our gifts do not come cheaply. <laughs> so go, going back to the our gifts, you know, you're going to pay, you're going to pay if you want to, if you want to make gains, you're going to have to pay for them. Uh, I also enjoyed the header for this chapter. There was a man who sat each day looking out through a narrow vertical opening where a single board had been removed from a tall wooden fence. So this guy's sitting in a fence. One board's missing every day, a wild ass of the desert passing outside the fence and across the narrow opening. First the nose, then the head, the four legs, the long brown back, the hind legs, and lastly the tail. One day the man leapt to his feet with the light of discovery in his eyes and he shouted for all who could hear him, it is obvious, the nose causes the tail. And we all know that he's very wrong. The nose does not cause the tail. And uh, this goes back to like a, like a Zen explanation of, of time and how time works. Cause I remember Alan Watts listening to some Watts wave stuff. There's, he talks about it, but he says it's a serpent. Like say you're at a fence and you see a serpent and it passes by the fence and you see the, the nose and then the body and then the tail. And then you think to yourself, oh, you know, like the nose causes the tail. Cause that's all you're able to see from your limited window. But really the nose does not cause the tail. It's, it's all, it's a snake. It's a whole thing. It's all one being. It's not, uh, and so that's like a Zen way of explaining how we see time in a linear motion. You know, you have the past, and you have the present, you know, and you have the future, you know, and so we think that it moves in this one way, and we think that the past causes the future, you know, like the past, like these things cause these things, but really it's a whole thing. <laughs> like it's it's the eternal now it's all one thing it's already been made it's not like this thing leads to that thing leads to that thing like that is a but from your perspective you would think that um from your limited perspective and i was like oh yes so it was cute to see uh, frank herbert take that that zen kind of explanation of of the eternal now and and use it and turn it into a, a reikian fable i think that's really cute Um, let's see here. So we're on Rackus. Odrade contemplates the Van Gogh painting in Teraza's office, and she doubts that Shiana has ever been her canvas. She thinks to herself, which of us paints the other? Which of us truly creates another? You know, like, am I being the one who's being painted here? Like, I, I've totally lost sight of this whole situation. An acolyte enters to awaken her and tells her that Teraza is arriving shortly. She finishes watching the sun rise over the mountains, which I also like when the sun rises over the mountains, there's like a clearly felt heat bounce on rackets. It's so fucking hot that when the sun peaks over the mountains fully, it's like, you know, everyone just like feels this like wave of heat that hits them. Terraza enters. Well, Dar, I think we finally meet as strangers. She's not happy. Odrade is startled, but not at the Reverend Mother Superior's threat, but at her lack of fear of the threat. She recognizes that she has crossed a line inside herself and there is no going back from it. She is now free and Odrade will never again follow another another's moral guidance rather than her own. That's it. I got a line in the sand. <laughs> I am going to follow my Atreides morality and no one's going to tell baby what to do. So it's not uh, Dar and Tar anymore, huh? 
perhaps it never was Dar and Tar. Oh, Terraza, you fucking cold bitch. Audrey tells her the alternatives to alliance with the Leiloxu could not be accepted, especially when I recognize what it was you truly sought for us. And with that, Terraza relents this fucking act. She's tired. She's jet lagged. She plops down on the couch. She pats the seat next to her like, all right, just come sit down with me. Like, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta talk. Audrey feels sympathy for their shared fatigue. And uh, they discuss how they must preserve the sisterhood. You know, Taraz is like, we got to preserve the sisterhood. But Dre's like, yes, 100. That's what I'm doing this for. Taraz is like, all right, well, you've been on the scene. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> What's going on here? Odraid reveals her suspicions that the axolotl tanks might not be tanks. Could they be female Leiloxu? Waff reveals the kind of behavior you see when a family member tries to conceal a deformed child or a mad uncle. And he's still not revealing what they did to the Gola or why they killed the previous ones. Odraid has also sussed out that Terraza has been contemplating killing the Gola and perhaps herself <laughs> and knows about Belanda wanting her dead from her friends at Chapter House. She tells Terraza she believes the Honored Matres have surpassed the sexual skills of the Bene Gesserit imprinters. And what if the Leiloxu planted those skills in their Duncan? Terraza asks Odraid what she thinks of their alliance with the Leiloxu now. And Odraid thinks that it is more necessary than ever. They need to be on the inside and they should not kill their Duncan until they themselves can examine him. Terraza tells her, you gave them a hold on us and us a hold on them, and neither of us dares let go. <laughs> Nodrade's like, is that not the perfect alliance? Uh, uh, what do you think? The two women know Duncan has been awakened, but they do not know if Lucilla has imprinted upon him yet. He is like a burning club. You know you might have to use the club for your own survival, but the flames approached at a terrifying speed. <laughs> like, that's such a funny description of Duncan Idaho. You're like, uh, uh, I, I want to hit somebody with you, but like at the same time, I don't want to get burned. Um, there are so many unknowns, and Terraza is still frustrated with Odraid over this alliance. Odraid slaps back with the words, just customary practice which is a, she knows, she's trolling her. This is a source of constant irritation for the Reverend Mother Superior. She hates the idea of the customary practice, the things you have to do. Odraid explains that if they don't change their ways, their enemies will see the pattern of their behavior and use it against them. And their enemies know their ways, just as you know what Belanda is going to say before she says it. And you thought you knew the limits of what I would say and do, but I've changed the beat. Okay, we're doing something different now. Terraza wonders if the Bene Gesserit have made a mistake in not making Odraid the Reverend Mother Superior. Odraid's like, no, no, <laughs> you're good. Wrapping up, they send for Shiana. Terraza examines the girl, says to her, I am informed that you may, you may become one of us. Shiana just sits there. Terraza's like, well... You know, do you have anything to say about that? Shiana trolls her. What is there to say, Mother Superior? You have said it all. <laughs> Tross is like, oh my God. Looks over to Drain. Or Drain's like, I told you, like, we got a live one here. Shiana knows only to say the deepest truths that she can sense to Terraza. At Odraid's prompting, she says that she understands that the Mother Superior wishes to know that if she is fully committed to the sisterhood, she stands tall under Terraza's searching stare. What is it you think you want from us, child? I want the same things you thought you wanted when you were my age, Mother Superior. <laughs> Classic Shiana. Classic. Oh my goodness. Again, Terraza's like, oh no. She warns her about uh, her insolence. You know, she's like, I appreciate your candor, but you know. Be careful, like, shut the fuck up. She informs the child that Shiana already owes the sisterhood much and that their gifts do not come cheaply, ma'am. All right, you think you're a little funny guy? 
Think you're a little funny guy? Well, I'll fucking get ready. Uh, Audrey thinks of how little Shiana appreciates what she will have to pay and wonders if she's ever felt and wonders if Audrey herself has ever felt alive since the sisterhood took her from Mama Sibia. So it's like you might have to pay with not feeling freedom or feeling like you're alive for the rest of your life. OK, like you're going to get these cool powers, but uh, these these neat tricks. But I don't know if I have felt alive since they took me. Shiana is dismissed and she is uh, stoked, sensing that she has passed the Mother Superior's examination. The two Reverend Mothers discuss the girl. Odrade believes Shiana has the potential to be a Reverend Mother Superior of extraordinary abilities someday. Could be going straight to the top. Turaza wants to know if she thinks the child is capable of killing Duncan for them since Teg won't do it. And she senses Lucilla, even though she would, she like kind of doesn't want to. Audrey does not see the noble purpose in this action, but gives the proper response, telling Terraza, do what you want to do. You know, like, sure. The mother superior remarks on how similar Audrey is to her father, Miles. And Audrey realizes that Terraza wants Audrey's rebellion. She wants her to be her opponent, to make her, her like at her best. The two discuss Waff and how the Leiloxu mask of stupidity uh, has diverted them from figuring out that they were using the Gola process to achieve their own type of immortality. But that when one acts, acts stupid long enough, you actually do become stupid. And that's real. Okay. I mean, I know that I've definitely started saying, like using certain phrases, like ironically, and then... And then you end up like actually using them. And then now you're just using those phrases and you're just like, oh, you know, like if you start calling someone bro, cause you think it's silly, like bro. Ugh. But then eventually you just start using the word bro. And you're just a guy using the word bro. Like everybody else, you're trying to be ironic and make fun of it. But then it's like, you're just adding to it. You're just doing the same thing. <sighs> Whatever happens though, the Bene Gesserit, <laughs> they, Terraza knows one thing. Whatever happens, the Bene Gesserit must punish those Leilaks who pieces of shit, though. For real, for real. And now, who fucking knows what their Duncan has become since he's left their observation? I mean, that guy has been taking leaps and bounds, and he's been out of the loop for a minute. So, good lord. What is he going to be like when he surfaces next? Chapter 37, your name is Woes. Woes me. <laughs> the name Woes, so interesting. Um, on Gamu, Duncan has been made to look like a Lilaxu master named Woes. Pubes shaved, cheeks padded, hair bleached, clothes loose, puffy, comfortable, warm, and water resistant. He's following his face dancer guide named Ambitorm, and the two have been silently traveling through the cold night through the bush. His guide utilizes animal tunnels, and Duncan has no idea where the fuck they are. Having so much time alone with his thoughts, Duncan wonders at what he owes the sisterhood, and he damns the Atreides for their demand of another life of payment from him. They finally stop at a cave, and his guide makes them some food that was carefully hidden for them there. And Batorm commands him to now call him Tormsa. Duncan asks Tormsa, why is he risking his life this way? And the man asks him, you know the Bashar, and you have to ask? Tech is so cool. Duncan guides uses the uh, guide's monoscope and looks down into the valley below and sees where they are headed. The city of Yasai, AKA Barony back in the day. And you can identify this city by the enormous black building at its center. It's 950 stories high, 45 kilometers or 29, about 29 miles long and 30 kilometers or about 18 and a half miles wide and it was originally built by the Harkonnens to make their subjects seem small. Just letting everybody know you're nothing. This is our big building. This is us. We're huge. 
that's you down there you're small go fuck yourself uh, and many people have vanished into that building, never to emerge. Tormsa tells Duncan that they will find Lucilla and Teg in the city if Lucilla and Teg make it through. He has seen a signal from their friends in the city that there are thopters overhead searching for them using life scanners high above them. To avoid capture, his guide instructs Woes to imitate wild animals and act natural. If they are scanned, continue doing whatever it was you were doing. You may pause for an instant, but then you have to go on as if nothing has happened. And you will know when you are being scanned when you feel a little tingle in your gut. Just play cool and it'll be totally fine. As they travel down into the valley, Duncan realizes that he's begun to accept his place in the scheme of others. He is goaded by curiosity to find out why he was brought back from the dead. It's only a matter of opening doors and to open the next door and open the next door and just keep opening these fucking doors until he finds the door that explains everything. Torm says senses the searchers and the two begin moving like browsing animals, tearing limbs off of trees. I'm just going to act like a deer real quick. Chapter 38. A quick bowl of soup. Yum. Um, it's dawn. And Teg emerges onto the main road, going into Yasai. Uh, he's been traveling on foot. Uh, and everyone on this road, most of them, are traveling on foot. A lot of them are farmers leading suspenser carts, carrying their their goods and produce into the city. And not only has Miles unlocked the whirlwind ability to move at hyperspeed, but he has also unlocked some heightened level of intuition, a type of second vision, knowledge of things around them right before they happen, awareness of where he must put his next step. And he also has this danger sense, you know, he can sense danger in people. So now it's it's kind of like it's he's unlocked like a form of prescience, but it's not like long form prescience where he sees like far into the future. It's just like it's like now, like eternal now prescience where he's in this now moment and he just knows like, OK, I need to go here and I need to go here and then you do this thing. And this guy's dangerous. Uh, um He's baffled by these new, yeah, intuitive prescience. That's a good way to say it, Nitronic. He's baffled by these new wild talents. How had the agony he experienced under the tea probe done this to him? It makes no logical sense in his Mintat brain, but he is forced to accept this mysterious new reality. Using his new ability, he approaches one of the farmers on the road and begins a conversation. As they speak, the farmer has subtly herded him close to the edge of the road where three more farmers move up and close in around him. And once they are concealed, the farmer tells Miles that they've been looking for him and there are those out there who are still hunting him. This man served under the Bashar at Rendatai. The ground car pulls up beside them and Miles is hustled inside uh, to continue on his way to Yusai. Oh, thank God. He can finally just rest in a car. And he's now riding in a beautifully restored pre-scattering car owned by the Planetary Bank of Gamu. And that's another thing that I really enjoy about Frank Herbert. He's like, this is a pre-scattering car. Okay, so that means what? Like, is this car like a few thousand years old? I love how they like build shit to last in Dune times. Like it's like, oh wow, that must that's a really long time ago. Is this car like a couple centuries old? Like how old is this fucking car? Um, but it's been beautifully restored. And the driver tells Tag that he's been missing in action for two days and asks him where he wishes to be taken. Tag gives him an address of a meeting and drinking establishment, unsure of why he made this particular choice. Like, this is one of the many safe houses that him and the Bene Gesserits have discussed in the past. But he picks this one intuitively. And uh, Tag asks after Duncan and Lucilla, but the driver has no knowledge of their status, but promises to give word of the Bashar's survival once it is safe. 
they've got about another half hour to use side, but Miles is like hungry, hungry, and he really needs some food right now. <laughs> so the driver knows a place and takes him to get a quick bowl of soup. He ducks inside the restaurant and soon a thick man with almost no neck, oh, he's like this, and an artificial voice brings him his soup. And noticing Teg looking at him, the man tells him he was ruined in the allegory explosion. Miles is so tired that he can barely pick up the spoon and get the soup to his mouth. He keeps, uh, it's like the soup's going everywhere. And so the ruined man grabs his wrist to steady it and helps him to eat the first few bites. But once he gets a couple bites in, he's like, okay, I can do it. I'm good. And during this interlude, the man tells him that his son lives because of Teg. And no one is going to put hands on Teg in this establishment. Miles is able to finish his bowl. Uh of soup and he would love another one, but he's gotta go. So he makes haste, gets back in the car, and the Bashar asks the native Gamu driver just how long he thinks the Arn Montres have been on the planet. And the driver tells him, like, since he was a child. Uh, so it's like, Teg surmises that they, they've been here for at least a hundred years, possibly. On their way to their destination, Teg looks out onto the city of Yasai, a chaotic and ugly patchwork made of mixed matched poor fitting salvage materials. Where the and it's like, were the Harkonnens responsible for the insanity of this place? What's well, the city sucks? Like, what is what is the deal here? They arrive, Teg walks inside and into the lift tube, uh, aka an elevator. <laughs> and they go up to the 57th floor to a private dining room. When he gets there, there's no one to receive him. It's a little sus. So he waits, and while he waits, he examines the windows of this place to find that the space provides a protective secrecy coupled with the ability to keep watch on the exterior world. And it's like triple armored plaz windows here too. So if anyone's got a missile out there, like it ain't getting through, <laughs> it's good. The men, Enter, oh, I also too, like at the corners of the mirror or at the corners of the windows, like you can look down and then there's like special mirrors in the corners so you can like see even further down and like across, which I thought was really neat. Um, a man enters the room and Teg's doubled vision tells him that this man brings concealed danger. The man's clothes tell the Bashar he's a mercenary and his accent tells him that he's from the scattering and is a Bashar or some equivalent thereof. The man introduces himself as Jaffa Muzaffar, a regional commander for the forces of Dur. He invites Teg to sit and apologizes for the interrogation. Sorry about that. And compliments his cleverness of letting his attack force wait until his captors were focused on trying to get information. Um, and uh, what a relief. They have no idea that Tag single-handedly killed all those motherfuckers. <laughs> they think that he had an attack force. It's like, oh, they've made a wrong assessment. Fantastic. They have no idea what I can do. Excellent. Um, the two men make small talk. Tag presses a button to summon a waiter so he can get some food. And Muzaffar informs him that there will be no food until his doctor has a moment to take a look at him. A doctor comes in and he has an orange souk diamond, not the standard issue black souk diamond tattoo on his forehead. And he also has these weird orange eyes. And Teg's like, is he an addict? Like, what is, what's going on here? The scattering souk doctor scans Teg and says that he's quite fit, especially for his age, but that this man needs food. <laughs> and he goes to order a meal suited to Teg's needs. While he waits for the food, Muzavar shows him a picture on his holostat of his home back on Dur. It's a frame bush. It's a plant that once it learns to obey its master, it will grow into a magnificent residence in only about four to five standard years. Cool. I want a frame bush house. You just get a bush and then you have to like make peace with this bush and have it like you. And then it just grows into a cool fucking house. Like, yes, I am interested in the frame bush. The food comes. Muzaffar has no snooper, but he offers to taste it for Tag. But Tag's danger sense 
His second vision lets him know that the food is fine. And he digs in and he crushes it. He just crushes this meal. And the waitress keeps bringing more and more dishes. And like he's eating so fucking much that he has to stop to take a shit like in the middle of his eating. He's like, I got to go to the bathroom. And he goes to the bathroom. And then it's like sucks too because it's like, okay, so not only... Did he have to deal with the tea probe and they're making him like fart all over the place and be gross? Now he's got to go take a shit in this bathroom and he knows he's being watched. And he's just like, Ugh. you know, the, the cum eyes or calm eyes, not cum eyes, calm eyes are there. But he's like, whatever. He takes the shit. He comes back. He returns. He keeps eating. He's chowing down uh, to the point that where the waitress and the field commander are just like shocked by the amount of food that he is putting down his neck. They're just like, what the fuck, bro? And once satiated, Muzaffar is like, I have never seen anyone eat like that ever. Like, I don't get it. What are you doing? And Ted covers for himself saying, it's a, it's a Mintat thing. It's not, but that's what he's saying. Muzaffar tells Ted that they've prepared quarters for him next door. And that it would be not, and that it would not be advisable for his friends to attack this place. And Ted is like, you think I'm your prisoner? <laughs> Muzaffar is so impressed with how based and awesome Teg is. He's like, by the eternal rock of Durr. You are wild, dude. You are not what I expected, but I gotta warn you. An otter mantra is coming and you better not take that tone with her, okay? You haven't the slightest concept of what's about to happen to you. And uh, Teg's like, an honored mantra is about to happen to me. <laughs> Muzaffar leaves to consult with the incoming Matre, and Teg is pleased that the field commander has gathered nothing important in their meeting to tell her. And that is it for session five. That's it for session six, our last session. Obviously, read to the end, but just for old time's sake, the last sentence of the last chapter of the book is uh, there was no answer but then she had not really expected an answer yay <laughs> alright so exciting and now for those of you on Twitch we are gonna go to questions and answers Mwah. 